All right, well, uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, welcome to this talk, uh, Docker-based, one-click local development. Um, my name is Albert Albawa. Some of you may know, know me already. I work uh, at a, my own shop called DCycle, and I'm really interested in uh, automation. So anything that has to do with automating testing, continuous integration, your workflow, or your local development um, stack is, is of interest to me. And this presentation is at GitHub. Uh, you can go to my Alberto56 GitHub account and you'll find it there. It's all, uh, you'll, you can find the source code and reuse it if you want. I like this quote, if it hurts, do it more often. Um, and I even apply this to my personal life. In your, in your development workflow, anything that is a pain or anything that, that you kind of procrastinate on doing, or in my personal life, my taxes or anything else, stuff that, that uh, you just don't want to do, just do it more often and it often helps. And I think that's something that has been, uh, it's a mantra that's been used more and more in, uh, in development workflows. What hurts more in your development workflow than local development? Um, I, I know for me, over several projects, over several years, I've had issues where I go into a new team and it takes often a full afternoon or a full day or often more than that to get a new person set up. And so every time this happened, I was like, how can, how can we make this easier? How can, we, how can we take this process that we don't want to do, that we cringe at doing, and make it so easy that we can do it within a few minutes or a few seconds and do it several times a day on new computers with new people, new developers. And I think I'm approaching something resembling that, which I've tested on several projects with several clients, and it tends to work quite well and have some surprising advantages. Um, so what are the, the kind of ideal principles of local development for me? Um, First of all, no dependencies. I want you to be able to unpack a computer and start developing locally. You don't need to install stuff. Everything just kind of should work out of the box. No configuration. Just download your code, run a command, and it should work. That, that for me is like a, um, would be a deal breaker if that didn't happen. I don't want it to be platform specific. Platforms are stuff like uh, Calibox on uh, Pantheon, Dev Desktop for Acquia. Um, so the, these kind of tools that purport to be simple tend to work fine, but then you're stuck with this provider of a uh, local so of a solution for a specific environment. So, for example, uh, if I want to move from Acquia to Pantheon, I'm stuck with Calibox. It's a bit of a pain to get that out. My code is already kind of formatted for Pantheon. Acquia requires a code to have. Uh, to the root of Drupal to be in doc root and Pantheon doesn't. And then Agar has this other system where it's using a platform and, and you need to, uh, your, your site is one local site among many. Wouldn't it be cool if we got rid of all that and had build scripts where I could take my code I'm working on locally, build it for Acquia and it's going to package it exactly as Acquia expects it to be. I could package it for Pantheon, package it for Agar as well. That's what I mean by not platform specific. No graphical user interface. Because anything with a graphical user interface is not scriptable. How do I, how do I take a point and click and script it into one of my scripts so that it's more automatic? Plus if I, if I run a server, if I start a new server uh, and I want to run some tests on a server based on a, on a development environment, I can't go log into a server I just created and, and uh, have a graphical user interface because there is none. So I don't want there to be any graphical user interface. Um, I don't want it to be provider specific. Actually, when I mentioned platform specific, I was talking about pr provider specific. Platform specific more means like I don't want it to be to work on Mac and not work on Windows or, or you know, I want it to work everywhere. Windows, Mac, and, uh, you know, new servers. I want it to be lightning fast. And lightning fast means I want it to be up in a few seconds. I don't want to wait 10 minutes while I'm provisioning some vagrant machine with with, uh, with uh, Ansible. I don't even want to learn Ansible. I, want, I, I just want to click a button and I want it to work. Um, my code base, I want it to be self-contained. So what that means is 
I don't want to have a, um, I don't want to be downloading external stuff. I want it to be one click in order to resemble production. Um, so, do you guys have any, any kind of questions or things you want to add on those? Is that a good plan of action for this talk, to say that that's kind of an ideal scenario? That makes sense? Not, nothing to add? Nothing to add to no dependencies? Well, we'll add Docker, but that would be the only dependency we have. Uh, I guess the, one dependency is okay, right? Um, now, platform specific, we mentioned that. No GUI, do we agree on the no GUI aspect? Do we kind of, do we, do we, are we all in agreement that we don't want to deal with the graphical user interfaces? Um, and do we want to move away from different, uh, to being tied to a provider? That's, I think, something we all, have, has, have all of you had that situation where you wanted to move code from one place to another and it kind of messed up with your code structure? Me too. Of course, we want stuff that's light and fast. Kind of the opposite of Vagrant. And I was talking about Vagrant earlier, and, and, and the thing is, with light and fast, is, uh, it's, not just, it's not just fast. It has a major advantage. If something takes a second to spin up, and you need to update it, for example, I want to update my code from PHP 7.1 to 7.2. If my local environment isn't fast, I'm going to try to find a way to log into it and, and have an automated tool to go in and update 7.1 to 7.2 and my local environment might be a VM running, uh, running Vagrant. And then I can't do that automatically with scripting, so then I have to learn Ansible and Puppet or Chef, and it just gets to be a whole hornet's nest. Something that's lightning fast, I just destroy it and rebuild it. I don't need to, I don't need to learn tools that force me to, to, to log into an existing environment and update it. I just destroy my environment and recreate it. And that's exactly what containers are. Um, I want to touch a bit more on this code base self-contain. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of teams do this by default. They are going to have their code, and then you download version, I don't know, 1.3 of their code in your computer, and you're like, well, what do I do with this? And then the team tells you, well, you have to get this database from somewhere that's not version controlled, and it's going to work only with that database. Well, the way I see it, if a specific version of my code doesn't do anything useful without having some external thing that's not versioned, well, my entire project might as well not be versioned. Right? I want my, every version of my code to do something useful so I can actually go in and test what that, version, that uh, code does. So I want my code base to be self-contained. And the way I do that, I'll show you in a few minutes, is I have, a, I have a very, very simple version of my database in Git. Right? So I download my Git repo, I run a script, and it doesn't try to connect to some external database that, that has maybe some sensitive data on it, download on my computer, I don't have the permissions. It just uses the database that's there. And I can start working, I can start theming. If for some reason, we do need to get the external database. We can still do it. But my code is going to work without, having, ha without requiring external, um, th external uh, items which are not version controlled. And frankly, uh, and finally, the last, uh, well, the next to last uh, development principle, one click, and we're going to check that out later. Resembles production. This is a quote I like from one of the founders of uh, Kubernetes. Any difference between environments will eventually lead to a failure. And I had that actually last night happen to me where my code was completely identical on two uh, servers and I, I realized one was running PHP 7.1 and one PHP 7.2. And this one weird command that was supposed to be PHP 7.1 compatible was causing my staging environment to fail. So I left a couple of hours because of that. Uh, so any difference, no matter how minor it is, will eventually lead to a failure. We're not, gonna, we're not going to, to fix this problem with local development on Docker. We're going to get as close to it as possible. But I'll give you some tips and techniques, or tips for, for what to be on the lookout uh, coming in the future to fix this completely. So the solution is containers and build. Containers, basically, who of you has, has used Docker here before in any capacity? OK, so are we all kind of? in agreement that the, the, the idea, we all kind of know what a container is, we know what a volume is, right? The main thing I want to get through to you is a container is disposable. Your container should not contain absolutely, well, should not have anything that is not, that we can't just throw away from one second to the next, 
right? A container should have version whatever of Drupal, all of your modules, that should all be packaged. And then your actual database and your actual files should be elsewhere and should be linked to your container via, via a module. So that's number one. Build is, how do you get from, we're not in an ideal world now where we're doing production on Docker, right? Most of us are not, who's using Kubernetes for pro, like production or, or Docker on production for anything here? Okay, you are. For, do you have stuff that you're not using uh, Docker on? Yeah, most okay, so most of us I would imagine are using either Agar or something like Pantheon or our own kind of custom hosting thing or AWS or some stuff that's not using native Kubernetes to, uh, do, um, to do hosting on a live site. So what that means is that we can't just take our Docker environment and bring it to production and it's going to work. We need to, to kind of go through an intermediary step to take our local uh, development environment and kind of package it so our um, production environment gets what it expects. One example of this is Acquia. Acquia requires you to give it code in a Git repo, which has all the CSS in it, which you don't want, because CSS is generated. We don't want to have that in our, in our Git repo. It has all of the modules. We don't want those either. We want to download those. We want to reference those. We don't want to have the actual code in our, in our code base. It has Drupal itself. Um, so Acquia expects it to be that way. So my build is, I don't want to work the way Acquia works. I want to work the way I want to work. I don't want to have Drupal in my Git repo. I want to have, I want to have CSS in my Git repo. But Acquia expects that. So I'm going to have a small script that's going to take whatever is on my running local environment or whatever CI environment I have from my containers, which I previously built using a, a kind of recipe. I'm going to take all of that stuff and bring it over to Acquia, to bring it over to Acquia's Git repo and tag it and say, okay, here, Acquia, here's what you want. But I don't want an actual developer going in there and, and having access to actual code of a um, module or of Drupal core. If you want a patch Drupal core, we'll do it in our recipe, as I'll show you in a second. So containers we mentioned encapsulate dependencies in your code. Uh, we've all kind of dealt with containers. I'll, I'll give a small demo so we'll see later on like, uh, what exactly that means. And the builds are, as I mentioned, uh, a level of, abstract, of abstraction between our way of working and whatever our you know, production environment expects. And that, if, if I want to move from Acquia to Pantheon, no big deal. I just add a new build script. Instead of building for Acquia, I build for Pantheon. That's all I need to do. So, demo. Uh, for the de has anyone actually read the description of the talk? I did. Anyone else? Yeah, you did. Too. Did you guys actually uh, uh, run the, the code I gave, the example code I gave? Okay. I'm going to show that to you because this is actually something that's, you know, that you could actually do right now and it's going to work on your computer. So the code is this here. Um, it's called. Um, yeah, it's called Starter Kit Drupal 8 site. It's on my, it's on my D cycle. Uh, account on uh, github.com. So github.com slash dcycle. Just look for the uh, starter kit Drupal 8 site. Download that to your computer. So here it is. Let me just uh, make that a little bit bigger. Does everyone see the code on this screen? Yeah. Perfect. So Start a kid Drupal site. I just downloaded it to my computer. It's going to be a bit faster than it will for you because I already have cached versions of all of the stuff. If it doesn't find the cached version, it's going to download them. It's going to be still one, one command. Um, here's the quick start that you can look at. So step one, install Docker. Step two, clone this. This is what I'm at now. And step three, run the scripts slash deploy. Uh, well, that's still step two, actually. Step three would be login link, click the login link. So let's see if this is works. It's a live demo, so probably something's going to go wrong, but scripts deploy. So there I have my nice ASCII art. It's doing everything it needs to do. Uh, it's, it's completely building a brand new Drupal environment. It's um, getting the database. It's setting, up a, it's setting up a database, and it's giving me a login link. So we can see that we're already a lot faster than Vagrant-based stuff. 
This was already running though, so I'm going to actually delete the whole thing using Docker Compose down v. This is all documented in the uh, in the GitHub uh, readme, by the way. So I'm going to get rid of not only my containers, but I'm going to get rid of my volumes as well. I'm going to get rid of all of my data. This is brand new now. I'm going to run this again. I'm actually going to run time scripts deploy.sh. So having the cached Docker images on my computer already, how long does it take me to go from absolutely nothing to a full-fledged Drupal environment. Let's see how long that takes me. So this would be the equivalent of having like a, a new developer on board uh, and, and run the script. So as you can see what it's doing now once it's built the Drupal site, the Drupal container, it's waiting for the MySQL container to be, I'll actually walk through this with you. Um, it's actually waiting for the MySQL container to be up and running. Pulls every couple of seconds. When MySQL is running, it says MySQL is up, moving on, installing Drupal because we did not find an entry in the user's table. So it checks. Is, is Drupal already installed? If it's not, I'll install it. I'll go ahead and install it. How do I install it? I'm going to import the database which ships with my GitHub repo. That's done. And of course, um, the, the, uh, the database might have been done a couple of months ago, but this gets the latest version of everything, including Drupal. So there's probably some, some uh, updates to perform on the database. That's fine, it's doing those. And so it's getting all the configuration. And I got 35 seconds. So this is, you're coming into a project and you're like, here, get the, get the code, run it. 35 seconds and I have a login link to my uh, project. There it is. Um, completely working um, project. I have a theme, I have everything I need, I can just start working right now. So that to me is the power of a one-click local Docker um, setup. I'm going to show you the code uh, real quick. So this of course obviously is all open source and it's available on the GitHub account. Um, so you can have access to it here. I'll actually show it to you in my uh, in my uh, text editor. So, a couple of things to note uh, with this. First of all, um, Docker Compose, well, first of all, this is not the right one, okay. So first of all, I'm not tracking Drupal core in here. I'm only tracking my custom modules, of which there's one, and I'm tracking my custom themes, right? I'm not tracking Drupal core. How does Drupal core get in here? Well, I have a Docker file here which explains exactly what I want to do. I get a Docker image which is public called vCycle slash Drupal 8. That Docker image is a Docker image which I myself maintain and I have a, I have a Jenkins uh, setup. Every Wednesday after the security updates come out, I rebuild this. So you don't have to think about security updates. You just build from this and you know you have the latest version of Drupal 8. If if you build it on a Monday and you download you know, version 8.5.1 of Drupal using this and you download 1.x of field group, let's say, well, the next time you run it on a Friday, we're automatically going to want to recognize that the DCycle Drupal 8 image has been updated. So every single line after that is rebuilt from scratch. So we're, we're basically, as, as long as we're doing development, we're always getting the latest versions of all modules, right? So we don't have to think about security updates. They kind of, it, it's a lot, actually a lot harder to not do security updates than to do them. Because just, just using this system automatically gets you the latest version of the code. And what's nice is that it's gonna fail if there's any problem whatsoever. For example, let's say I want to apply a patch to some module or a core, right? This would be an exact, it's commented out, but this would be how it would, would apply a patch. So every time I rebuild my container based on the current versions of all modules and core, it's gonna run this patch. If this patch, for example, has been applied to the stable version of core, it's gonna give me an error, it's no longer gonna apply. So as soon as I try running my, my deploy script and this patch no longer applies, it's gonna tell me exactly what's going on. So I can log in there, remove those lines, redeploy and everything's going to be okay. So updates of code become part of your workflow. They're no longer something that we need to think about separately. 
Uh, that's number one. Number two is a Docker Compose file. Most of you have used Docker. Has, have any of you used Docker Compose? Show of hands. Okay, a couple of you. So the idea of Docker Compose is that Docker is cool for building new containers based on images. For example, a Drupal container with all my modules, a MySQL container. Then they have to talk to each other. So the Docker Compose file is exactly that. So in this case, we have, uh, I have two so-called services. One of them is Drupal, and it's based on my Docker file we just saw. And it has some, module, some volumes here. So for example, I want my custom modules I have in my Git repo to correspond to my custom modules on the container. So while I'm developing, I want, to be able to, I, I want this to be shared from my container to my uh, local development environment. It, it's exposing a port 80, and it's linked to a service that's called MySQL. Well, MySQL, where is that service? It's defined right here. And here I'm just basically using um, an image, which is a public image of MySQL, and it has some environment variables with some very unsafe, um, uh, with some very unsafe uh, credentials, which is why you don't want to use this in production. Same thing, it's going to have, it's going to define volumes. So volumes is all my kind of data, which in this case uh, is my database itself. I want this to be a volume so that if the container disappears entirely, the data, I can rebuild the container is still going to be there. <coughs> I want to show you a few things more um, in this demo. So number one, I'm going to re, let's say for example, Drupal's been updated and I have a running version of Drupal. So if I docker compose ps here, I see that while I have my two services, I have MySQL and I have Apache. So, or Drupal rather, I need to deploy this, I need to deploy a new version of this. So I'm gonna download something my colleague built or that, for example, Drupal core was updated. I'm gonna rebuild this using scripts deploy. Right, I'm gonna time that as well. So it's gonna do the exact same thing, but there's an if statement in there at one point. And the if statement is, this one here. So you, earlier, our, our, my, our MySQL database, which is a volume, was empty. So it reinstalled Drupal. At this point, MySQL is already running. So we're going to assume that we're not going to install Drupal, but we're going to still run the update scripts. Drush updb, drush config import, all the stuff we need to do to get our local database up to speed with what our colleagues have done. So one command to, to so we're still one click, right? We still have script slash deploy.sh. That's our one command to do everything. Uh, 15 seconds, right? So this is not, and we don't even have to learn Ansible or Puppet or Chef. We're just destroying a, a container and rebuilding it, right? Who knows Ansible or Puppet or Chef here? A couple of people. I never got my head around it, and I don't want to. I do everything I can to avoid learning those, those systems. Um, I believe we have to learn it at some point when we want to go into production, because we need Ansible to manage our, um, our Docker hosts. But we don't need it for development, in my opinion. Um, I had a few other things I wanted to show you. OK, so what's cool with this? is that we can also, now that we have a running environment, we can do a bunch of stuff with it. Here I have another project. I'm gonna destroy this one actually. I'm gonna docker compose down. Notice I'm gonna say docker compose down and not docker compose down v. Because docker compose down just kills all my containers, releases those resources from my computer, but keeps track of all of my volumes. So all of my databases, my files are still there. So next time I, up, I, I run scripts deploy, it's gonna be, it's gonna have my data. So docker compose down, and it'll take a couple of seconds, and that's done. I'll go to another project that I'm working on called Steward uh, Healthcare Services. So I'm going to Docker Compose PS. I have a bunch of running containers. These work fine. They have their original version of a database that was used to populate them. So all is well. Now let's say I want to my you know one of the specifications is this needs to be. To, to, um, to have accessibility standards, to, to, to meet certain accessibility standards. Or the code needs to pass unit tests, or the code needs to be linted, or it has to, it has to be some browser tests of some sort. What's cool with Docker is that I don't need to worry about installing these things in my Docker container. 
Docker containers are running, I can run these in separate containers. I'm going to run some linting here. Um, so I have a, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Because I know that I never manage to see screens when people share them at these conferences. Is that okay for everyone? Okay. So this is how I do accessibility tests. Let me just make this a little bit bigger. Now the important thing to understand here is I'm not actually adding any accessibility testing framework to my container. So I'm not breaking anything. I'm attaching it to my container. How am I doing that? I'm, do I'm running docker run. If you know the docker syntax, you know the docker run vCycle Pally. vCycle Pally is something I set up. It's like a docker um, wrap around. Let's see here. I'll just show it to you real quick here. Yeah, here it is. So it's just a, it's basically wraps around. Don't look at that failed little tag there. That's going to be fixed soon. But the idea with Docker Pally is that uh, you just run, you can run Docker decycle, Docker run decycle Pally Amazon.com. It gives you all of the accessibility errors on Amazon. You can do this today. Actually. You don't have to you don't have to install. You have to download it. You just run it. How about if you want to run it against a running stack? Well, you have to give it the same network name. In this case, uh, if you notice my Docker Compose file defines a network called Starter Kit Drupal 8 Site Default. That's my network name. So when I'm running Pally, for it to have access to the, um, the Drupal website under HTTP slash slash Drupal, it needs to be on that network. So I, I, gotta, I gotta say that. So in this case here, my network is Stuart 8 Default. I have to tell it which network it's on. I'm giving it the, um, I'm, I'm calling the Decycle Pally Docker image, which I just showed you. I'm telling it what kind of errors I want it to show, and I'm ignoring a bunch of stuff that in my particular case, uh, I know is not working, and I want to fix eventually, but I, I don't want my test to tell me, these are all stuff uh, r related to, um, to colors not being the right contrast ratio. I know that doesn't work, and I think the Pali tool doesn't give me the right feedback to fix it, so I'll just ignore it for now. But all the other stuff I want to do. And which site am I running it against? I'm running it against HTTP slash slash client. As you can imagine, client is a website, or a, rather a service in Drupal speak, which exists in my um, Docker Compose file, and here it is. This is the service I want to run against. Against. And why do I have access to HTTP slash slash client from my accessibility tester? It's because I put it on the same network, Drupal Steward 8 default, as this, uh, this whole website is, is uh, installed. A couple of other things. Let's say I want to lint my code. All right? Same deal. Let's go back to, uh, where was I? Here. All right, so I have something called... Um, Let's, let me just see. Um, so I, I'm, I'm running a bunch of Docker commands based on something called dcycle php lint, which is another project I'm maintaining. So Docker run uh, dcycle php lint, you share as a volume all of your code, and this is all documented in the, in the, in the GitHub uh, project. Um, and it's going to lint my code for me. So let me, let me just go ahead and lint that. So I'm going to script lint. See what happens. This is actually a project I've been working on, so it's, it's going to pass. But again, what's interesting is the linter, I don't have to install a linter on my container. I just have to grab a linter that's out there on the Docker Hub, point it to my code, and say lint my code. So I'm not polluting my code with a bunch of linters and browser test ex extensions and PHP unit stuff. Uh, and, and SAS to CSS kind of extensions. All of that stuff is done in external Docker files. So we're using a kind of pseudo microservices mindset where every single thing is done in a completely separate space. Microservices actually means something slightly different, but I'm talking about the mindset of not having a monolith, having stuff work separately. As you can imagine, if I go in and I, and I uh, well, you know, 
it's, I'll do it for fun. I'm going to go into this uh, site here and I'm going to change, let's say I have a, a developer came in and uh, I don't know, removed some comments. All right, so I'll save that and I'm going to push this to my, my CI environment, let's say, and now that I'm, I don't have any GUIs, right? So don't forget, I don't have any GUIs, so I can tell my CI environment to spin up a new server, have a local version of my setup, and run linting. And that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to do it locally here, save time, but if I run scripts uh, lint, I'm going to notice that it should fail in theory. So I asked my developers to run this locally before they actually push to manual code review. Sometimes they don't. If they don't, it's the continuous integration environment is going to tell us, well, there's a missing function doc comment here, there's an excess extra space here, or whatever it is. Unit tests, same thing. I'll run scripts unit. I don't have to install PHP unit on my Docker container. Again, I'm just running Docker run PHP unit. Here's my code, run my tests. Right? I don't have to worry about what Drupal tells me is the right way to run unit tests. I run unit tests the way I want to do them, separate from my um, Drupal setup. All right. Are you guys having fun? I know I'm having fun. Okay. So I'll give you some advantages of uh, maybe a recap. A cleaner code base and builds. This, this to me is huge. I, li I love to use. Uh, let me just see if I can find something here. Um, I love to use uh, manual code review. So the stuff like this, right? So that my colleagues can go in and say, hey, what's, you know, line this, what's weird, whatever, and, and you know, add comments and, and things like that. So this is the GitHub interface, like what, what is this here for, et cetera. So I love doing that. Um, the fact that I'm not Let's say that I update web form from 8.5.1 to 8.5.1 you know, to 5.2 or whatever it is. The fact, that I, the fact that I'm not tracking the code in my Git repo means I'm not going to have super huge pull requests with code that's in fact just changes to web form. My manual code review process will be web form 8.5 to 8.85.1 which is what we have with stuff like Drush Make and, and so on. And we have that for a while. In my case, it's even a little bit simpler than that because don't forget that we are, in this particular example, we're not actually downloading specific versions of stuff. We're just saying, download the latest version. If it passes tests, I'm good with it. So I don't want to think about versions. You know, in your specific business case, you might say that we need to actually track versions. It makes it a bit more you know, time consuming to get stuff up to date. In my case, I'd rather the things break and spend that time that I would normally spend updating modules on actually doing real development and once in a blue moon fixing something on production. I mean, I'm not, you know, managing a nuclear power site for, for, crying, for crying out loud. So it doesn't matter if once a year something breaks because of this on production, I don't want to think about it. If it does break on production, I'm going to add an automated test for it so that next time it breaks, it's going to give me a red flag on my continuous integration environment, which in my case, I'm using Circle CI, which is a free one. And um, this is conflicts. Let me just check another one. Yeah, so here, this, for example, uh, Circle CI tells me all is good. So in this specific case, so what, what does Circle CI do? It runs a script which builds my entire site, runs my accessibility checks, runs my browser testing checks, lints my codes, runs my unit, my unit tests. If that's green, it's like saying, okay guys, you can go and do a manual code review. If that's red, don't bother doing a manual code review. So that kind of adds a lot to our process as well. Okay, um, move on with the presentation. So cleaner code base, to me that's cool because I can then 
build it to whatever specifications Acquia needs after. Attach tests without modifying, you know, without going into install PHP unit next to Drupal with compose. I don't care about that. I want to just run my tests on, against code. That's exactly what I'm doing. Don't have clone databases. I want someone to be able to just get this code and start running with it, which is why I have a version of PHP, uh, of, of rather of the SQL database in my code itself. Automatic security updates. Well, automatic. I mean, you have to still run scripts deploy, but how easy it is to go have a Jenkins server that runs scripts slash deploy every Wednesday at 10 p.m. It's pretty simple, right? That's automatic security updates for me. My code can be patched, modified, specific versions. It just follows a recipe. It applies, a, and, and if something breaks, it's going to give you a big red dot. You don't want actual developers doing this stuff. You want developers doing stuff that has value for your business. Our workflow can apply to non-Drupal aspects of our product. Our project, so we have Redis, or we have Solar, or we have whatever. All I need to do at this point is to go into my Docker Compose file here and say, well, in addition to Redis, I have Solar. I have instant to Drupal, I have Solar. You know, I have Redis. I have a bunch of other services here. And then Drupal can access those through HTTP dot slash slash Solar or whatever port it needs. So that's kind of cool too. Uh, that's another surprising fun advantage. Easy continuous integration. We're not using a GUI. So, and for, for those of you who are uh, maybe a bit intimidated by, by uh, continuous integration the way I was, it, it could not be simpler. CircleCI is a free tool that for private or public repos gives you 1,500 minutes a month. That's more than enough if you design your tests well. And then you tell CircleCI what you want to test. How do you do that? This is all code you need, right? Build a machine which has Docker. Build a machine which has Docker installed on it, which the machine does by default. Run script slash ci.sh. In my in my case, that's a script I built. What does that script look like? Well, I run my tests. I run my de I deploy, and I redeploy in case you know maybe the second time I deploy there's going to be a bug. So I do an incremental deploy, an initial deploy, and I run my fast tests, which are unit tests, linting, and all that stuff. And for some of my project, I have another line here saying, okay, once now it's deployed, run some browser testing, make sure that you can click around, run some accessibility tests, and so on. So this is the kind of, I mean, this is like 10 lines of code, right? And, and you have, and you link your CI environment to GitHub, for those of you who haven't left GitHub, and then it just kind of works. It gives you a big green dot. Say, fine, go and you know, review the code. Or something's broken, click here, see exactly what broke. OK, this patch no longer applies, and so on. All right. That's fun. Isn't that fun? Improving your workflow is easy. Well, now that we have all these kind of micro Docker containers doing a bunch of stuff, I need, OK, now I need to not only link my code, I need to run this weird thing that you know, analyzes whether there's lots of code, which is copy-pasted from one place to another in my PHP code base, and then give me a, a node between one and 10, and if it's more than seven, fail. Let's say I, I get that as a requirement. I don't have to install anything on my Docker containers. All I have to do is have a new Docker container, which has this little piece of, you know, this little library that does this, point it to my existing code, and say, go ahead. So separating. Um, separating your, your different, uh, what, what you're trying to accomplish into different Docker containers. Config management is great. Uh, you guys all use config management on Drupal 8? Okay, so how does this work on uh, Docker-based uh, setup? Well, all of my config is here, right? You, you'll, you'll all recognize these things as configuration. And this is, this is all exported by Drupal, so how do I do that? I need to log into my Docker container once I've done developing and export my config. And then when I build my, when I build my system and I, and I re-import my, and I run my update script against Acquia or whatever it is, it runs drush config import. Um, do you guys want to see a demo of that? Or is that something you guys know by heart and you, who, who would like to see me actually change a description on a field and export it to config using this me mechanism? Does anyone want to see that, or are you guys one person? If I have more than three people, I'll do it. OK, so this is my site I showed you earlier. Let's just say, um, 
the hero. So this is my git. This is my git repo. Now let's say I, I get a, a requirement to change something. Oh, oh that's no. I, I killed it. That's why. I'm gonna re. I'm gonna rebuild it. Uh, super simple. Scripts deploy. Always scripts deploy. That's the one command you need with this if you use this as a starter kit. So I run several different uh, projects for several different clients. So having this ability to destroy and rebuild containers within a couple of seconds is really great. So I just rebuilt it here. Um, I'm going to log in here. Let's say one of the requirements is um, add some, I don't know, uh, go to one of my content types, let's say my article, and add some sort of a description to the body. Like, I don't know. Please do not make this longer. Or please do not paste from Word. That's something I would like to say to people often, but they don't get it. Save settings. That's it. So now I have it in my local database, not in my config. If I do a git status at this point, my git status has not changed. All I need to do is scripts export config, which is a script I made as a wraparound for uh, the, um, the config management. Let's go and check git diff. So that worked fine. At this point, I could commit this, and anyone who downloads this co code and runs scripts slash deploy.sh is going to have a line in scripts slash deploy.sh which runs drush config at import. It's going to get this code, and that's, that's all there is to it. Um, now, I'll just show you what that looks like. So, uh, first, yeah, go ahead. What more than uh, drush CEX do you do in the, uh, in the SH to export config? Nothing. This you mean this here? This is this. It's just it's just this. Okay. So I'm I'm actually logging into Drupal, and I'm running Drush CEX deploy. What does that do? It deploys it to some path on let's say var dub 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 slash config or whatever path I define in my settings file on the container, not on my local computer, but through the magic of volumes. Let me show you that real quick. I'm sharing Drupal slash config on my local Git repo with var www config on my container. So any change that's done to the container on var www config is automatically reflected in Drupal slash config, which is what I want in my Git repo. Does that kind of answer your question? You, you seem, you seem a bit. Uh, well, well, I'm a little confused about what's happening right there. But... Okay. So this is basically the concept of Docker uh, volumes. So what this is saying is that the, these, just before the, the, colon, the colon here, these are paths on my Git repo. So let's say Drupal slash config is going to exist here. And here it is, Drupal config. This is exactly what that's referring to. And what that says is, Whatever change that's made to Drupal config on my local Git repo should be reflected on my container, and whatever change made to my container should be reflected on my local repo. In fact, they're the same, the one and the same. It's a volume, and that's, the, that's basically what the, a volume is in Docker. It's Docker, a, a Docker container is disposable, but the volumes themselves have a persistent existence locally. And conf configuration is one example of that. Yeah? So if you're a Drupal file, you don't know the on the dot slash path for the rest of your git. Where, where, where do these files go? They just uh, go on a special Docker. Volume. Which Drupal files? The one that says here Drupal files indicate. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so the Docker has this, or the Docker kind of engine has this concept of volumes which are not really tied to any place. So that's a good question, actually. Um, so this is more like kind of uh, Docker basics, but uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing to know. So anything that doesn't start with dot slash is not actually on your Git repo. So you don't want your Docker, you don't want your files to be on your Git repo. You want them to be persistent, but you don't care where they go. So you define your services here, and you define your uh, networks here, and here's where you define your volumes. So I have two volumes, I don't care where, the, where they go. I don't want to track them in Git. I want them to be persistent, but I, for now, I, I, I want to get let Docker deal with where it puts them. Drupal files is one of them. It puts them somewhere in, in you know, uh, 
slash var docker something or other, and it keeps it there. But I don't care where it goes. I just say I want it to exist. If I move this to Kubernetes or production or, or Docker Swarm or something, and I need, I need to have a better uh, grasp of where my volumes go, I could add, well, Docker file, I, I could say, well, cache, dot, dot, I don't care where it goes, but Docker Drupal files, I want that to be linked to an Amazon volume on AWS or whatever it is. For local development, I don't care. That make sense? Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, so config management is really cool for that. It's like, if anyone has ever used features on Drupal 7, you're, you're not going back after this. It's just, it's not going to happen. You're not going to be using features again. You're going to refuse to reuse features. That's one of the side, that's one of the, the, the downsides of this is that you're, you're just going to say, no, I'm not using features. Absolutely. Huh? Absolutely. Well, it's an yeah. It's an upside. You're right. You're, you're going to refuse to do stuff that doesn't make sense. It's like using old, legacy, clunky ways that waste your time to get configuration from one place to another. Let's see how we did. No dependencies. We just installed Docker. We don't need to install anything else. And that's super, super important when you have new developers come on board. You don't want them to install five different things, version this. Latest version of Docker, it's going to work. Windows has a Docker for Windows. Mac, Linux, you can install it on the, uh, on the server. You have DigitalOcean has Docker pre-installed on, on VMs. You can have an API which spins those up. That's cool. Not platform specific, so we don't care if, we're on, if I'm on Windows, you're on Mac, whatever, it doesn't matter. No GUI, we don't want GUIs for what we're doing. We've, we're past that stage. Not provider specific. In this case, I, I, a lot of my stuff is on Acquia, some's on Pantheon, I don't care. I'm using the same exact workflow. It's lightning fast. We agree that less than a minute is lightning fast. And if we already have everything cached and up and running, 15 seconds is lightning fast. Do we agree with that? Yeah, it's uh, 16 minutes with uh, Drupal VM. That's not acceptable. You yeah, that's not acceptable. And then, that's, and then you're saying, ah, oh, do I want to spend 16 minutes? Okay, I'm, I'm going to actually log in. I'm going to SSH in. I'm going to update what I need to update for, to avoid, and then you're, you're introducing errors. That's not acceptable in today's world. <laughs> our code is self-contained. We want to have a simple version of our MySQL database in our code base. I don't want people requiring a two gigabyte production database with all like people's credit card numbers, because mm -hmm. that's where I keep people's credit card numbers in the database to be able to theme a button. You don't want that. You want people to be able to start right away. And it's one click, or in this case, one command, scripts deploy.sh. What did we not do? Dev resembles production. We can make dev resemble production as much as possible, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna resemble the production. The solution to this is to, not, is, to, is to keep using Docker locally and push towards eventually moving our production stuff to Kubernetes and Docker so that we have an exact replica in development, staging, and production. Right now we don't, and that's okay. Um, the solution is not to use Calabox, in, in my opinion anyway, and actually a dev desktop and those things which purport to reproduce whatever vendor's production environment we want. It's to think right away that in two to five years, everything's gonna be on Kubernetes and Docker. Start thinking that way right away. And that was the talk. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. If there's any questions, uh, Go right ahead. Uh, it's okay. You can ask a question at the same time if you want. I'll start here. Uh, Lando, have you heard of Lando? I never have. Can you can you maybe enlighten me? I just found out about it like uh, a week ago. Okay. Basically, it, it uses um, Docker to like install um, Drupal. Like it's, cool. It sounds like it's similar to what you're doing, but it's it's um, specifically. Cool. So some sort of a it supports other environments. Oh, okay. So it's like an open kind of platform to do something like this. It's a more open Calabox. I think uh, Calabox is actually now uh, on the down. Okay. Cool. So Lando might be something to uh, to uh, to explore for sure. That's I didn't know about it, but uh, the more open source tools like this there are that are based on Docker, the better. So that we can we can eventually work together and maybe choose the one that's right for us. So that's cool. Good to know. Another one is Wasp. I don't know these. So what, what's uh, one? Wagby. Okay. W O D E Y. 
Uh, it's kind of sim uh, similar to what you're doing, um, but uh, one thing I like is it uses uh, make up. <coughs> so okay. you know, make up and to uh, which okay. Term? Wadby, how do you spell it? W O D E Y. So two tools were mentioned, Lando and Wadby, that they kind of do this type of thing. So you can go out and check which which uh, workflow um, corresponds the most to what you guys want to do. One thing I would mention, perhaps, is that above and beyond the tool, it's it's really a mindset we have to 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 change the mindset of moving towards these Docker-based tools as opposed to trying to reproduce some legacy production uh, system, in my opinion. Uh, there's a question over here. Yeah, the question is, um, I use Google VM with a Git repo, with uh, Circle CI, and pushing to acquiesce or all that. Um, one of the pain points for me sometimes is to, uh, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a, an initial SQL? Uh, I agree with, with uh, uh, um, a very basic initial SQL that you can just, you know, yeah. Start, but sometimes it's nice to have a, a, a minimum of content, like taxonomy terms and a few things like that. I mean, what's the? I put all of that stuff into my initial database, and okay. if you need more, you just get the production database, and you can script that because there's no GUI. Don't forget that everything is command line. So I have um, here's an example where I have a script called get database from stage, and what that does, it logs into my staging environment. It, downloads a, uh, an archive of the database from stage, it logs in, it compresses it, it moves it to local, it brings it to the container. It takes a couple of minutes and I get the database from stage. You don't want people to spend more than one click doing anything. So if getting the staging or production database is important to your team, having a script like that, to me, in, in my opinion, is the best way to go. There's a question over here. Uh, I just had a comment about uh, Lando and Wabi. I had the occasion to use both tools, and they're very far apart in terms of intent. Uh, okay. Wabi is just like you showed, it's a bunch of Docker Compose files, and they call the images. It's all committed to a Git repo, so you're basically customizing environment or work so pretty much the same way. Okay. So uh, Wabi is something that resembles the other and the other one was uh, Lando. Lando, yeah. Yeah, Lando is more like the kind of tool chain you get to go to Pantheon and they say install this command line utility and we'll deal with it. So okay. it's a wrapper around Docker, Martin is very So to me it's really like a... Um, if, if there's any error in it, it leaks and you don't know how to fix it. Yeah, to me it's really a mindset. Like, uh, in my opinion, I'd rather work with this and the reason is it's, it's not rocket science. It's like a YAML file and... I mean, to me I don't see why I would need some third-party tool to deal with this stuff. If you feel that like a third-party tool is gonna, it's gonna be more consistent across developers and so on, go right ahead. As long as as long as we're using open source stuff and we can move from one to another when we when we see fit, I'm, I'm I find the more tools the better. Let's let uh, let's let, let people have as much uh, control over their projects as they, they can. Uh, one other thing about Wadi, it's sort of built around their. Uh, their service, which uh, orchestrates deployment through Docker on uh, on generic servers. Okay. Uh, but that's a pay service. You don't have to use it. Uh, but uh, is that using a uh, Docker Swarm or Kubernetes, or it's just a uh, custom thing? I'm not. I, I didn't actually use that part of it. I, I just uh, played around with it, and it was useful in a local environment. And yeah, all the configuration can go in your Git repo, so it's. Yeah, uh, this is kind of attractive in that it's not tied to something else. If I yeah, if you like having complete control over what you do, uh, this might be a good uh, good place to start. To try the others as well. I encourage you to, to look at those. I know I will. Any other uh, questions? The time's up. I don't mind staying sticking around. I think there's a pa there's like a pause after this. So uh, if any of you uh, want to leave, I'm not going to be offended. As, as this gentleman is not offended. <laughs> But uh, if any of you want to stick around, I'll be uh, I'll be glad to uh, to answer your questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. There's a question here, Mark. Uh, you can maybe those of you who want to still ask questions, maybe uh, come forward and we can uh, have a, a quick discussion. Uh, just wondering how easy it is. If you have some custom tools like a special user, how easy it is to set up a software image to calculate that. What kind of custom tool do you have? Uh, nothing else. You, you talked about a custom, you did something that has a 
Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, sh I'll actually show you, I'll show you the code for the linting tool, because it's, uh, it's quite ridiculously simple, actually. Um, okay, so basically, there's a linting tool that exists that I like, and it didn't have a Docker way to install it, so I just created this Docker PHP lint thing. And uh, so there's a readme file that shows how to use it, and then there's a Docker file which has exactly these lines of code uh, where I'm getting Composer, I'm installing zip, I'm uh, requiring the code sniffer and the Drupal coder, and I'm, I'm just basically installing it using their install, uh, whatever, their, their um, documentation. That's it. And then I'm putting the entry point to be the path to that tool. That's all there is to it. And once you have that, you can push that over to the Docker Hub. So you, you basically open a Docker um, a hub, uh, an account on Docker Hub. And I believe I put this one at PHP Lint. There it is. So I push it there. So now I can just run uh, Docker run PHP Lint. If it doesn't find it locally, it's going to go to the Docker Hub, download it. So to me, like I did this a couple of times, it takes me about 15 minutes to do it at this point. I just, well, oh, damn, there's no Docker you know, equivalent. I'll just build one, no big deal. So First time you do it, it takes about a couple of hours. You're starting from a, an existing Docker container for the PHP stuff, and you're stuff Yeah, well, in this particular case, um, this is a PHP, uh, a PHP you know, library. Uh, I have some other stuff like, uh, let's see here, CSS lint that I built. Uh, which is based on Node. This is even simpler to install. It's just npm install CSS lint from Node. So I have a, a, a Node uh, installing CSS lint. One thing to keep in mind with these things, though, is that they tend to get outdated. Um, so you build it, and two years later, you're still using the same image. So what I like to do is I have a... Uh, so for example, I have this... Wait a second. Let me find it for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Come on. It's in your personal now. Uh, no, this is under Decycle. I don't know. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, in this case, I have, you know, from Drupal 8, I, I like, you know, the, the, the official community image does not have comp uh, Drush, so I like to install Drush. I like, I like Drush 8 personally, I don't like Drush 9. I don't want to use Compose quite yet to install my modules. Eventually I will. Um, I like to have Vim installed and my, my SQL client and so on. So, but if I build this and I push it to the Docker Hub, it's going to be stuck at whatever time I pushed it. So what I like to do, and personally I have this, um, I, have a local, I have a Jenkins environment, which itself is a Docker container. It's running on a server I have. And I have a project called Docker Drupal, which every Wednesday after the security updates come out, just rebuilds that and repushes it to the to the hub. And what that looks like is, um, let's see where that was. Yeah, it looks like this. So every time it pushes it, it tags it with the current uh, the current uh, UTC date and time, and says, "Okay, this, I'm, I'm rebuilding this." And you can do this. I, I do this with a couple of other projects. I mean, Drupal, of course, is security sensitive. But even the PHP linter, I don't want to, three years from now, to use the same one I'm using today. So installing a um, Jenkins job, which rebuilds these every once in a while, and gives you a big red X if it doesn't manage to, might be a good practice, because then you have the latest version of the tools all the time. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Cool. You guys, anything else uh, you want to talk about? I'm, I'm free. I'm here. We'll be glad to answer any questions or take any comments. You're looking for contributors? We can get the size of that image down. You can get what? We can get the size of that image down by not running half yet by installing the PHP. The See, that's the kind of thing I don't even know about. So, so I would there's love like, there's to. A, there's yep. a Docker method for installing PHP modules that is not. You're right, there is. Connects. Yep. And there's a way that what you do is you. Because you have to purposefully select the dependencies. So, unlike using something like app get or whatever. Yeah, anyway, so. This is kind of a little bit more. No, but that's a really actually good point. Because I don't even. I wouldn't so consider can, myself a Docker expert, so that's the kind of thing I would like, love to. Uh, my big concern about using something like this is that your image size is like 220 meg yep. or something, which yep. is too big. Okay. Um, I guess if you're running Drupal, then you're like, whatever. Um, so this is what you're talking about, right? But for speed, like if you were running, if, 
Yeah. So what you do is you, and that, like, you think that's going to work the first time when you add the thing, and then it'll error out because there are all these dependencies that add get yep. this yeah, thing. Yeah, put the dependencies uh, yourself. Yep. So that's laziness on my part. And then, and then what you get to do is you get to clear the image of all the dependencies that were loaded, and so you get like a snapshot of the image right before you install this thing, and then you can use that to build something <coughs> else, and then you can clear the image and then reload the dependencies that you had installed, so your image size ends up being something like you know 10 meg or less. Um, and then that it's just like basically a diff to another Docker image file, so you're building from whichever version of PHP or whatever. And then your load time, you're talking about one second or whatever, you can get your load down, down to like an attempt at that. That's amazing. That, with, just with what you already have. I'm wondering, um, in the actual, so if I go to uh, GitHub Drupal Docker, because uh, I'm basing my image on the community so site. The so the community would version is... That the community version does this, what you're talking about already. Probably, yeah. Okay, let's just check real quick. Um, sure. Here it is. This is the community version I'm based upon, and it does exact. Uh, it does app get though. We're yeah, doing does, it do, does it clear it out there? Um, so that, yeah. So there's this this guy. There's like a manual purge that's okay. happening on all the app stuff. So that the purge. Thing, yeah. That's cool. That's exactly. I mean, if you do, if you would like to go into my. Uh, to the Fill around uh, there. yeah and, and give a pull request with that I would really really appreciate it um, let's see uh, what was it again it was github yeah this is the one so github decycle docker dash Drupal so and there's Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 so if you want to give, give, give a pull request for that uh, I definitely right would love to add that to the uh, to the project thanks cool all right, you're not leaving. Do you, no. you still want to discuss anything, or? Uh... I want to get back to unit testing from last year. Was that, was that the one that you gave last year? Yeah, yeah, I gave one on unit testing. Yeah, yeah. This is a good one. This yeah. is you to talk to. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thanks for doing appreciate it. Appreciate it, yeah. I'm, uh, thanks for the feedback also, I really appreciate that. No, this is great. I'm going to, like, this saves me a week. <laughs> I'm stealing your work. That's what I do. I save people weeks. It'd be nice to set up an automated build process for this too, so that when a new release comes out or whatever, it just can build each version. Like if uh, you want to set up a custom version of PHP with specific extensions or whatever, so when a new Drupal version gets sent out, it pings something, and then we just do an auto build on the newest version of PHP that installs whatever extensions or whatever. Well, it, it does. It does. It, that's pretty much what, it, what the, my Jenkins shop does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But with like extra build steps, we can rebuild the PHP image. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool for sure. I just don't want it to break too often. If it's like if five lines of code, there's little chance of it. No, that's that's if it's based on the official image and it uses their build process, like it breaks if the official packages break. Okay. So it's that's the kind of stuff that's pretty stable. This, this is really stuff beyond my competence level. So if, if you want to jump in there and, and yeah, help me out with that, I would really love that. Sure.